Wow, everyone quieted down. I didn't even have to say anything. Uh, welcome, everybody. I want to wish everyone an, an especially warm welcome. Uh, David McGrublian, chair of the board, our other trustees are here with us. Uh, this is just a really special occasion. Uh, whenever we do a chair, I'm reminded at, at what my eight-year-old said when he first heard about a chairing ceremony. He says, Dad, you mean they don't let you sit down at work? Um, and there, there are a lot of really special memories having uh, participated in chairing ceremonies over the years. And I think it's actually one of the most special things that, that we do. Um, I want to congratulate and thank a series of people uh, today. First, uh, President Emerita Pam Gann, uh, whose vision and dedicated leadership are so key and instrumental to our celebration today to have attracted this chair and uh, come up with the conception of expanding our marvelous PPE program. So let, let's give Pam a, a hand. Uh, second to our special honoree today, Professor Adrian Martin, whose pathbreaking scholarship and teaching uh, in PPE and the philosophy department more generally have, have already made an invaluable uh, contribution uh, to our college. The students just rave about your classes and your scholarship is, as, as I think we'll all see, is, is very, very exciting and we're just so pleased to have you. Uh, Peter will be introducing uh, Professor Martin uh, in, a, in a few minutes. Um, third, I want to acknowledge the tre tremendous depth uh, talent commitment of our philosophy department. Um, it's hard to imagine making any improvements to our philosophy department. It's got to be the best philosophy department in the country and I think uh, Adrian has proved that proposition wrong by coming and even adding uh, to the extraordinary talent uh, of uh, our very special philosophy department. Um, Last uh, but not least, I'd like to thank and congratulate Akshata Murthy, a graduate of 2002, uh, trustee since 2011, uh, and her great husband, uh, Rishi Sunak, um, who have endowed this special chair in philosophy to expand our wildly successful uh, PPE program in philosophy, politics, and economics. Um, first, as you may know, uh, Rishi is a rising star in British politics. Uh, he was elected as an MP last year uh, to take over the seat for Richmond, previously held by the senior leader and former Foreign Secretary, William Hague. Unfortunately, his important role in his party's conference this week prevented him from joining us. I know from talking to him how sad he was about not being able to make it, his excitement about the chair, about uh, philosophy, about PPE, about tutorial learning are at least equal to Akshata's and the rest of us. And also uh, to Akshata herself, who's really a global leader in socially focused entrepreneurship uh, with a strong interest in consumer products and the fusion of traditional Indian, traditional Indian designs. Um, the Times of India referred to Akshata as an ideapreneur. And I think uh, in many ways, Rishi and Akshata share uh, a vision for putting entrepreneurship to work to lift our broader society. They appreciate very deeply the lessons and greater values of higher learning, liberal arts, and tutorial pedagogy. They understand uh, how innovation, uh, both in politics or business, uh, is very much dependent on the quality of our thought. Uh, and because of that, I think, are both committed to philosophy. Uh, the power of philosophy in improving the quality of our thinking with its insights on values and logic, on mind and reality. Uh, and indeed, as uh, Professor Martin has explored, even on the role of hope as a force in shaping our human experience. Akshata's dedication to CMC is exemplary. Uh, her generosity of time and talent on the board, her long uh, trips uh, to California from London and back and forth from India, her offer of generous support at every turn to grow extensions of our Indian and British CMC families, 
uh, and es especially uh, their joint generous con creation of this transformational chair. Uh, each of these contributions and all of them together to inspire and move us all to even greater ambitions. ambitions. Uh, I think we're all very, very lucky. Uh, I'd like now uh, just to see that, where is the plaque? Um, I'd like Akshata to come up because we have a, a commemorative uh, plaque to give to you and, and to Rishi. It has your names and it says, in gratitude for establishing the Akshata Murti uh, 2002 and Rishi Sunak Endowed Professorship presented with appreciation by Claremont McKenna College. Uh, Akshata, congratulations and thank you so much. Thank you very much. I'm now going to turn the program to our outstanding new dean, Peter Uven, who will introduce Professor Martin. Thank you. Good afternoon. So, Claremont McKenna welcomed Adrian Martin to the community here in 2014 from the University of Pennsylvania where her research focus was on, and I'm quoting her, thick emotional attitudes such as love, resentment, hope, and gratitude, which essentially incorporate both subrational and rational elements of human psychology and thus have interesting and distinctive influences on rational deliberations and choice. End of quote, by the way. In, in addition to several journal articles on human emotions and moral emotions, Adrian is the author of a book, How We Hope, A Moral Psychology, which has been noted as, and I'm quoting again, one of the most rigorous, insightful, and sophisticated analyses of hope now available. I intend to go and buy it tonight. At least I hope so. She is currently writing a book examining interpersonal hope called Hope in Humanity and also editing the Routledge Handbook of Love in Philosophy. Adrian received her bachelor's degree in philosophy from New York University, her master's in philosophy from the University of California in San Diego and her PhD from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Adrian, would you please join me at the podium? As Dean of the Faculty, it is my honor to present you with this medallion. The front features the seal of the college and the back recognizes you as the inaugural Akshata Murthy and Rishi Sunak, Associate Professor of Philosophy, Politics and Economics and George R. Roberts Fellow. This medallion is a physical representation of the endowed chair that you hold and you will wear it with your academic regalia. Congratulations, Adrian. I was warned it was heavy. If I start to get shorter. Um, thank you, Peter. Thank you, Hiram. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming. It's really warming to see so many people here. Um, let me make this go away, if I can. No. Okay. <clears throat> um, I want to thank Priya and Maria for organizing this event, um, and I, I want to thank all of my colleagues and my students over the last year who have made my transition here to CMC. Um, as easy as pie. Uh, and uh, of course, I want to thank especially Akshata Murthy and Rishi Sunak, whose generosity created the chair I hold and facilitated an expansion of the PPE program that promises to be a really great success. So in my research, my big questions concern interpersonal relationships, that is, relationships between persons, 
understood in contrast with objects or things. I'm interested in questions like, what sort of distinctive value do people have as persons, and what does it take to respect and cherish that value? Questions that closely follow include, what does it take to be a member of the moral community, that is, the community that we refer to when we talk about distinctively human rights and interests? What does it take to be a member of a less universal, more local community, such as a nation, a religion, a club, a family? What claims do we have on our fellow community members? So my talk today is titled Broken Campaign Promises and Their Emotional Aftermath. Promising and other closely related practices like avowing one's commitment to shared values are distinctly interpersonal practices. What one person can genuinely promise another depends on their relationship. Some promises presuppose co-membership in the same community, for example. Furthermore, promising works a change on the relationship. Now one person has claims she didn't have before, and the other has new obligations. So my aim today is to make some headway understanding the role of practices like promising in interpersonal relationships by focusing on one familiar and timely kind of promise, the campaign promise. I should admit up front, however, that this is a stealth talk in at least two ways. So first, um, I will talk at least as much about the personal as the political. A lot of my examples will be non-political. Um, and second, I'm ultimately going to suggest that promissory relationships, while important, are perhaps not the most interesting or most important interpersonal relationship that develops along the campaign trail. So it'll be useful and fun at lunchtime to have a concrete case to bounce some ideas off of. So I'm going to use a few clips from the, uh, the recent HBO miniseries, uh, Show Me a Hero. For those who don't know, Show Me a Hero was created by David Simon and William Zorzi of The Wire fame. Paul Haggis directed it, and it's based on the book of the same title by journalist Lisa Belkin. It depicts a battle over public housing in Yonkers, New York, in the late 1980s and early 1990s. In 1985, a federal judge ruled that the city had intentionally and illegally segregated its public housing and schools, and he ordered the construction of scattered site public housing as a remedy. The show centers on Nick Wasisco, who in, the, in 1987 defeated the longtime incumbent Republican mayor to become the city's youngest mayor. As the city council's Democratic minority leader, Wasisco had voted to appeal the public housing court order, and in his mayoral campaign, he argued for continuing to fight the order. So here's some clips depicting. Vote for Wasisco. Vote for Wasisco. Vote for Yonkers Future. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. For you. Right. Go get. Okay, can anybody hear that? Can you guys hear that? Mm. Can I get help? So this first clip depicts him on the campaign trail. Adam Kidd, thank Angelo's you, dead thank to you. me now. Oh, well, all right. Well, he's not dead yet, so oh, vote for Wasisco, all okay? Right. Martinelli's been mayor a long time, too long, in fact. All right, he's no longer listening to the voters because what I'm hearing, what he should be hearing, is that the people of Yonkers want the housing decision appealed. You go to the Supreme Court. <laughs> that you judge ain't gonna build that garbage no how. Okay, look, I don't, Not where I live. I hear you. I, don't, I just don't think that we should. Tell that judge to go shove it. Kind of brings out the ugly in people. So you're the fellow taking on Martinelli? That's me. Well, how do you do? I'm doing very well. I'll do better if you vote for Wasisco come election night, all right? All right, you bet. I think the people of Yonkers should have their say. And if the people want to have their say, they're going to be voting for Nick Wasisco next Tuesday. So Wasisco won the election by just under 1,500 votes, and public opinion polls showed that his opposition to the housing had tipped the election in his favor. His opposition was short-lived, however, because the appeal was denied. 
by major. Major cities, cities that matter. Yalakas matter. Cities of 150,000 population or more, you are definitely the youngest mayor in America. Which means you're officially a rising star in the Democratic <laughs> Party. Ah, <laughs> oh, nice of Martinelli letting you work out of the office before inauguration. Hey, good man, Angelo. Hell of a guy. <laughs> Where the hell is Cheryl? Can't just leave the phones. Mayor's office. Big plans. What? Well, yeah, I'm saying. The lawyers all I want. The lawyers? The lawyers. Nick here, Nick Wasisco. The mayor. Mayor elect. Right? Yeah, hi, Mike. Uh huh. No grounds at all? Yeah. Right. Okay. Well, thank you. All right. Bye-bye. They denied our housing appeal. Cited and sealed on every count. I voted for the appeal, and I lost. Nothing I could do about that, right? Yeah, they can't blame you. Right? Yeah. <clears throat> so the show pushes something like this interpretation. So at this point, the mayor and the, the city council are facing having to comply with the housing order or um, pay fines that would rapidly bankrupt the city. Um, and the show pushes something like this interpretation, that Wasisco was naive and culpably so, that he should have taken time to discover that he was expressing a commitment that he couldn't keep. The incumbent mayor knew that the appeal was going to be denied. Everybody knew that they were in violation of the court order and that that was what was going to happen. But he kind of looked the other way. And so even if his, he was sincere, his desire to be mayor caused him to jump at the first opportunity to concretely distinguish himself from his opponent without doing due diligence. He had no business opining, but the suggestion from the way the show is presented anyway, he wasn't deliberately making a false promise um, or intentionally deceiving his supporters. Now, do you suppose his supporters saw it that way? As you might guess, they did not. Um, so this is the last clip, and here's a city, uh, city hall meeting after the majority of the council is considering complying with the housing order. So now, obviously, 
a whole lot of these citizen responses boil down to racist fear and anger, which would be directed at anyone supporting the housing. But they also have a directed anger regarding Wasisco, grounded in the belief that he's either an oath breaker or a liar. So what I want to do is take a look at this kind of anger and also at some other emotional responses we often see in such contexts to consider what they might teach us about interpersonal practices like promising. So let me briefly note one useful thing about a case like Wasisco's for my purposes. So I want to distinguish two kinds of inquiry. The first is, as philosophers say, normative. What promises ought people to make? What promises is it right to keep and wrong to break? When should we endorse a betrayed promisee's anger, and when should we condemn it? The second kind of inquiry is non-normative, an examination of the conceptual relations among the various attitudes and practices, such as, we ask questions such as, who is in a position to make a particular promise? What exactly does one commit to when one makes a promise? If a promisee is or is not angry about the broken promise, what does that reveal about her attitudes towards the promiser? So for today, I'm engaged in strictly the second non-normative kind of inquiry with particular focus on that last question about the presuppositions of the anger. Um, the fact that candidate Wasisco's opposition to the public housing and then his supporters' anger at his reversal, that they are morally and legally problematic, that fact should help keep this in sight. The analysis I developed does not endorse these attitudes, right, but is delving into their content and connections and presuppositions. So we can identify three families of emotional response to failures to deliver on campaign avowals and promises. Um, okay. It looks to me like the uh, presentation's off, uh, off balance, so we'll see what happens as we go on. So um, first there's the responses that we saw on the screen. Outrage, resentment, a sense of betrayal. Call this the anger family. Second, there were responses like feeling let down by contrast with being betrayed or being disappointed in the politician. So call this the disappointment family. Note that these feelings are different in kind from the disappointment we feel when events turn out different than we had hoped. Say, if there's no rain in October, I'll be disappointed. The feelings that I'm focused on for today, though, are feelings that target people as persons. Uh, their disappointment in a person. And as I'm going to be suggesting, this is a disappointment that creates or modifies a specific kind of interpersonal relationship. So we don't see many examples of disappointment in Show Me a Hero, because the negative responses are mostly rooted in racist fear, which, as we know, leads to anger. But it's easy to imagine if, say, a close friend or family or staffer of Wasisco's was opposed to the housing, they might feel less angry and more disappointed, or disappointment in addition to anger, at his apparent post-election reversal. So finally, there's a, feeling, a family of responses I'll call the regret family. This is another group that receives little attention in Show Me a Hero, but is probably personally familiar to many in this room. I frequently get neither angry nor disappointed when a, when a campaign of owl goes, uh, gets left in the dust of policymaking. Uh, instead, I feel resignation or even acceptance, uh, maybe regret at the way the political cookie crumbles. So these regretful feelings mark out an attitude, my attitude towards much, if not all, of the campaign and electoral process here in the U.S. Call this attitude the no promises view. It says precisely that. There are no campaign promises because what promises, can, what politicians can accomplish once in office depends on so much beyond their control. For example, who holds Congress. And we all know this, right? So any apparent promises then should be instead be heard as avowals of values or commitments, um, the no, or goals. The no promises view can apply globally, right? Implying that there is literally never any such thing as a campaign promise or it can apply locally so that you might think that in this case, for one reason or another, this candidate should not be heard as making a promise. Now, what I've just described is a pragmatic but sincere version of the no promises view. There are also, there's also a cynical variant, right, which where you think that all candidates or this candidate, they just say what they need to say to get elected, and apparent promises shouldn't even be heard as sincere avowals of their values, right? Um, I'll set this view aside for my purposes today, but that's, 
which is not to say that cynicism isn't the correct view in many cases. So the sincere no promises view makes, set of the re makes sense of the regret family, right? If I feel regret or resignation when a politician does other than she apparently promised on the campaign trail, this indicates that I don't think she actually did make and break a promise. It also indicates that I don't think she was being deceptive when she avowed the relevant values or that her actions in office genuinely betray those values. Instead, I must think something like the circumstances make it too difficult for her to enact those values at the present time. So there's no failing on her part. Now consider the angry responses of Wasisco's supporters. There are a few possibilities. The most obvious is that they believe he made and broke a promise to never concede to the public housing order. Another is that they did not hear his campaign language as a promise, but they did hear him as avowing his belief that the order was wrong, and they think his post-election actions reveal that maybe he was deceiving them or that at least he egregiously failed in his duties as a candidate. Perhaps he let his overweening ambition obstruct his efforts to understand the issue on which he was taking a stand. Finally, consider disappointment. If one does believe Wasisco made a promise, disappointment rather than anger is possible, at least for some. As noted earlier, it seems especially likely from close friends, family, and staffers. If one holds the no promise view, disappointment makes sense only if, as with anger, there is nevertheless some perceived failing or character flaw to target. One might think that although Wasisco didn't promise to fight the public housing, he did make a show of avowing his view that it would not be good for the city. Or perhaps his failing was that he didn't think things through and realize what he was signaling, or he didn't care, or he let his craving for public admiration drive too many of his choices. So the difference between anger or disappointment on the one hand and regret on the other depends on the attribution or non-attribution of a failing. Regret, acceptance, resignation, um, when we do not get what we hope from a politician, these feelings require that we think the salient explanation lies not in something bad about the candidate, but in the political process or context. If anger and disappointment have this in common, that they indict their target, what makes the difference between them? And now is the first time that question is supposed to appear. So what makes the difference between anger and disappointment. That's gonna be my focus for the rest of the talk. Okay, so here's a tempting account. Um, anger is a response to egregious failings and disappointment to lesser. If I attach great importance to the subject of a promise or a values avowal, that sets me up for anger, betrayal, resentment, while lesser matters leave me poised instead for disappointment or feeling let down. In short, it's tempting to think the difference between anger and disappointment is a matter of degree, tracking the severity of the target's failing. But this is not a right, the right account, I don't think. It doesn't fit with a number of observations about these emotions. So consider, we often experience simultaneous anger and disappointment targeted at the same failing. A friend's or sibling's lie may produce both anger and disappointment. Indeed. We often experience both when politicians, especially those to whom we've hitched our wagons, fail us. The anger and disappointment families are both psychologically and conceptually compatible, so they cannot mark a difference in degree of failing. Also, even given um, even extremely egregious failings can produce disappointment and not anger, given certain contexts. So with Cisco's family, friends, and staff members, even if they were strongly opposed to the housing, might feel only disappointment or consider intentional deception by a repeat offender with whom you have a close relationship. You might find yourself thinking, oh, he's lying again, rather than, oh, he's lying again. So, uh, or two, um, how we often respond to the failings of our children or our siblings. Even in cases of major wrongdoing, we may feel little, if any, anger while harboring instead a profound disappointment. Finally, and related to this idea of profound disappointment, disappointment can be as or even more awful than anger or resentment. It can be really and truly awful to have someone disappointed in you, so much that it would be you would prefer their anger. So qualitatively, disappointment is not a lesser response than anger, either for the person feeling it or for the person targeted. So a better count, I believe, um, of the difference between anger and disappointment 
begins by looking at the relationships where they occur, rather than the targeted failing. Looking back over the cases I've described, we can discern two kinds of relationship, structured by two kinds of claims the parties have on each other. So first, there are what we might call deontic relationships. These are relationships structured by claims of duty and right. When I make a promise and you accept it, we thereby enter a deontic relationship, where I have a duty to you and you have a claim of right on me that I keep my promise. Another deontic relationship is structured by the practice of consent. When I consent to a medical procedure, I erase the doctor's duty of restraint, say, to not perform surgery on me, and I waive the correlative right claim of right that I had against her. So those are examples of deontic relationships. Then there are relationships that seem, in a way, more personal. These are structured by not claims of duty and right, but expectations about what the parties may legitimately urge or press upon each other. For example, when people choose to enter into long-term committed romantic relationships, they do typically gain certain duties and rights relative to each other, but they also gain certain legitimate expectations, for example, of emotional support and reasonable sacrifice. These are things we wouldn't demand from each other as claims of right, but we do have legitimate expectations of each other. Or to take a non-romantic example, imagine two students who meet while traveling abroad and decide to climb a very challenging mountain together. The one in the back is my, my baby brother um, on his way up Cotopaxi in Ecuador. Uh, he describes himself as an adrenaline-interested person. <laughs> um, so these two students who meet while traveling and decide to take on this, they too are in a deontic relationship, no doubt. They have claims of right and duties to each other. But they're also in a personal relationship with an understanding that they can and should expect support and reasonable sacrifice from each other in pursuit of their project. So I'm going to coin a term for these especially personal seeming interpersonal relationships, and just so you can see the words again. Um, deontic comes from the Greek root dion, expressing the idea of obligation or necessity. Um, the Latin root, instans, expresses the idea of urging or pressing, so I will call these instantive relationships. Um, and that's it for jargon, I promise. Um, in an important uh, subdivision of moral philosophy, the concepts of accountability and responsibility have become associated with deontic claims. That is, it is said that to hold a person accountable or responsible is to demand their compliance with a duty, to make a claim of right. In my own earlier work, I adopted this technical use of accountability and just urged that we recognize interpersonal emotions that are not deontic, like disappointment. But when we think about instantive relationships and the claims structuring them, it's pretty natural to think that they too are about holding each other accountable. So to throw another case in the hopper, consider two friends who embark on a new exercise regime together. This is a stock photo, I don't know these people. Um, but there's the sentiment. Right. Um, part of the point of doing this together, being workout buddies, is to hold each other accountable. To be able to say, come on, get out there with me, don't let me down. And I bet it is common for friends to think in terms of accountability, but I bet it is uncommon for them to think they have rights to each other's exercise. So I think that the concept of accountability is broader than the way it's come to be treated in moral and political philosophy. Being in deontic and instantive relationships means having distinct forms of accountability authority or standing regarding each other. The promisee, and here we assume the legitimacy of the promise, has standing to demand fulfillment and to resent non-fulfillment. Not everyone has such standing. A party external to the promise can point out the duty of fidelity, but cannot demand fulfillment. Nor is it appropriate for the third party to resent the broken promise, though they have standing to feel indignation on behalf of the promisee, depending on their relationship. The exercise buddies have standing to urge each other to keep going and to feel let down by inadequate effort. And again, not everyone has this standing. While parties external to the exercise buddies project can perhaps point out that it would be good for the buddies to be there for each other, 
It would not be appropriate for them to urge this or to feel let down when hearing of a no-show morning. So this then is the proposal. Um, when one person's response to another's perceived failing is one of the angry emotions, like resentment, this indicates that the first person believes she is in a deontic relationship with the target. Um, specifically, she believes she has a claim of right that the target has culpably failed to answer. In many cases, this is a right she believes the target gave her, for example, by making a promise. We see this with Wasisco's supporters venting their outrage at City Hall. They believe they have a claim on him, a right to his opposition to the housing, a right he granted them when he either promised or sincerely avowed his commitment to that opposition. When one person's response to another's perceived failing is one of the disappointed emotions, this indicates that the first person believes she's in an instantive relationship with the target, with legitimate expectations she has standing to urge upon the target, though not demand as a claim right. In some cases, this is a standing she believes the target gave her, perhaps through a public vow, perhaps through an explicit agreement to enter into a joint project. If, as I have, I have imagined, with Cisco's friends or staffers were to lament, how could you let me down like this? They would thereby manifest their belief that they have standing to urge upon him his opposition to the housing. So how do we get into these relationships or acquire these forms of standing relative to each other? It's been implicit in many of my examples of instantive relationships that we often just find ourselves in them without explicit decision or invitation or commitment. We just find ourselves with our parents and our siblings. And many friendships and partnerships grow so organically that there's no moment where we grant or are given their constituent expectations. Deontic relationships, too, can just happen to us. Parental and filial duties are clear examples. Unexpected obligations can arise within voluntary relationships, too. So if I contract with someone to care for my elderly parent on a regular basis, I thereby choose to enter into a deontic relationship defined by the contract with duties of payment and provision of a specified work environment and rights to the specified labor. As time goes on, though, I'm likely to find other duties incumbent upon me. If she suddenly turns out to be in need, unrelated to her work from me, I may feel myself duty bound to help. This is um, something that the philosopher Henry Richardson has worked on. He calls it moral entanglement. So both deontic and instantive relationships can just happen to us. But they are also relationships we can explicitly invite each other into. And it's informative to think about what we are inviting. So this line of thought will also, again, wrap us back to the political case. So there are doubtless many ways to invite someone into an instantive relationship, but a prominent one is to invite them to embark on a joint project. The mountaineering students and the exercise buddies solicit and commit significant resources, time, energy, attention, as well as physical resources, to the pursuit of a shared end. They're also mutually aware of the possibility of failure, and that the probability of failure increases if either doesn't do their part. They thereby also mutually solicit and commit trust in each other. Through these exchanges, they enter a new or a new articulation of a previously existing instantive relationship, wherein they have special standing to press on each other continued pursuit of and investment in their project. Now, so far as I have imagined them, these invitations, acceptances, and the resulting instantive relationships involved equal and like participation by both parties. But they needn't be like that. One student could be an expert mountaineer and invite the novice to join her. One of the buddies could be a longtime runner and invite her sedentary friend to sign up for a race and train with her. Then the resulting relationships may be lopsided. One party may have more or stronger expectations of the other, expectations perhaps of greater investment or sacrifice. Another lopsided instantive relationship is where one party needs the other to empower her to do something they both value. So just hypothetically speaking, suppose a two-career couple wants to move to Southern California. The partner with greater career mobility may agree to make sacrifices to support the other, enabling her to land a job that moves them both to the left coast. Such a joint project would be structured by expectations of different kinds of contributions to her achievements so that she can be positioned to do something they want. This personal project models an instantive relationship commonly found between political candidates and their supporters. 
Candidates seek positions where they are empowered to do things no one else is empowered to do. And sincere candidates ask for the support of those whom they share value, with whom they share values and goals. They ask supporters to invest in the mutual project of getting them elected so that they can pursue shared goals. When supporters answer such campaign calls, join me and together we will make America great again, they enter into an instantive relationship with the candidate. This relationship is structured by expectations of different kinds of contribution from the two parties. The candidates have standing to urge their supporters to say, send money and get out the vote. Supporters have standing to urge the candidates to campaign and then govern in a way consistent with their purportedly shared values and goals, and thus they have standing to feel disappointment when, if the politician fails to do that. So the political campaign is indeed personal. I have just shown images from the campaigns of Eugene McCarthy, Robert F. Kennedy, Ronald Reagan, and Barack Obama. I take it they were all candidates who inspired a particularly high level of personal investment by their supporters. But the truth is that all candidates, even the most cynical, seek and invite at least some degree of personal investment. So we started with the idea of campaign promises, and promises are paradigmatic invitations to deontic relationships. By looking at the range of emotional responses to broken campaign promises and forsworn values of owls, we came to recognize a related but distinct kind of relationship, a relationship that is not about duties and claims of right, but where the parties nevertheless have standing to hold each other accountable by urging or pressing their expectations on each other. Although the relationships where the instantive is most salient are intimate ones, I suspect this is only because we tend to downplay the deontic with our intimates. Intimacy withstands urging and pressuring better than demanding and enforcing. And in the public realm, duties and rights claims are important. We're not willing to downplay the deontic in that context. But we should not, therefore, miss the crucial role of invitations to shared projects, personal investments, and the claims and emotions arising from them. Thanks. Thank you, Professor Martin. We will now open the floor to questions. If you please raise your hand and we'll bring the microphone to you. Um, I appreciate your comments very much, uh, Professor. I think they uh, hit the subject very well. Having been a chief of staff to a major elected official for a number of years. Um, I often tried to categorize things when we had a tough issue and uh, we, I basically broke it down for uh, the mayor uh, on a tough issue. We wanted to know who was sad, who was mad, and who was glad. <laughs> the people who were glad were most likely our supporters, but occasionally they were not, but they were glad because the decision uh, affected them in a positive way. Uh, the people who were mad were more likely not going to be our supporters, though occasionally there would be a supporter who would be mad. Those people, I always felt, um, were going to be very difficult to retrieve because they were seriously mad. We ought not to discount them if they were a supporter, but we uh, should clearly um, recognize that we might not get them back. The ones that we really concentrated on were those who were sad. Because those who were sad were the ones you say are disappointed. They were likely our supporters. They were sad because they thought the decision was wrong. And they needed particularly strong attention as we went on, unless, or we were going to lose them as supporters. And it's a shorthand way, but it was, I think, capturing some of your categories uh, about how you analyze it from political sense, regardless of uh, the right or wrong of the decision. Yeah, yeah, that's really interesting. That's great. Yeah, because I, uh, on this analysis, what this would say is that the reason to focus on the efforts on the sad group is because that sadness presupposes this kind of personal investment, this sense that there, we're in this together. And if the disappointment isn't reach, hasn't reached the point where they're now going to just write the politician off, 
that means there's this relationship there to be drawing on and to try to try to rebuild. Yes, thank you. That's really really helpful. Thanks. Hi. Um, thank you very much for your speech. Um, so we are at a college setting. What kind of relationship do you think? that peers in this college would have with each other? And what kind of relationship does the faculty and staff have with the students in terms of your speech? Oh, I think we all have both kinds of relationships on multiple levels um, int intertwining in various ways. So I'm distinguishing the two kinds of relationship in order to um, understand my entry into it is to understand the difference between um, this angry response and this disappointed response, the mad voters and the sad voters, right? Um, and so I'm, I'm prying those apart in order to distinguish these two kinds of relationship. But that's not to say that the relationships are mutually exclusive. Um, in fact, I mean, I, I, it's hard to imagine a human relationship that doesn't have some elements of both. Um, so uh, it's really a, it, it's a question of um, when the deontic versus the instantive is in the foreground, right? Um, I think in a community such as ours, as a, in a small, tight-knit community, um, the instantive tends to be in the foreground, right? It tends to be that we're thinking about the projects that we're all mutually engaged in and the contributions that we can expect from each other and that we owe each other. Um, and it's much less about sort of demanding our rights and enforcing them. But, those, but we still do have rights relative to each other. Um, and we do still have duties that if we shirk, um, it's appropriate that people hold us to that and enforce it. Um, so, and sometimes those rise to the foreground. But I do think for the most part, we're sort of more grounded in the, the personal project. Yeah. Hey, Adrian. Hey, Paul. Um, so I was, in, I was interested in the, the talk about campaign promises because it's got this characteristically deontic language. And I was wondering if part of what you were suggesting is that the reason that, uh, that uh, you take the no promises view is that within that context, you see this deontic language as really making instantive commitment. Yeah, so right. that somebody's saying, when they say, I promise to repeal such and such, the right way to understand that is that I'm going to do everything in my power to pursue our shared value of, mm -hmm. et cetera. In which case, if they don't accomplish it, uh, you're not going to be disappointed. Sort of technically, if you saw it as a promise, they would have broken it. But if you understand it as an avowal of the pursuit of shared values, if they haven't repealed such and such, but they've done everything in their power to pursue this shared project of doing that and come up short, then is the suggestion that we should see that in a certain way as a, a, a success, as not a proper object of disappointment, uh, but certainly not a proper object of anger. Yeah, so, so my thought is that if you take, say, say you take the global but sincere no promises view, right? So you think that the way that the campaign process works and that we all should know it works is that some of the, what some philosophers would call the felicity conditions for promising are not present, right? Um, you can't genuinely intend, so one of my examples when I first started working on this topic was Obama's campaign promise to close Guantanamo almost immediately upon taking office, right? Which then left a whole lot of his supporters pretty upset, right? But the fact of the matter is that politically speaking, he probably couldn't have accomplished it and he made a choice not to uh, spend all of his chits on that because he wanted to pursue health care, right? Um, and so one interpretation, so one, it, so, so if you say, look, I, when, a, when a politician says, I promise you I'm going to close Guantanamo, um, you have to hear that language. 
not as making a promise, but as you say, as, you know, it, I, as expressing a value or a goal with the, in the, with the background that, you know, we all know there's going to be some crazy terrain that I'm going to be facing, and I don't know if I'll be able to deliver on this, right? Um, I don't think that that means that what's happening there is um, necessarily an invitation to an instantive relationship. It's just an expression of your values, right? It could be. It could be, you know, if he's speaking to a group of people to whom, he, you know, he knows this really matters a lot, and he's sort of, you know, get on board with me and we're going to achieve this, then he is inviting them into an instantive relationship. And then it really does make sense for them to be quite disappointed when he doesn't carry through. Um, but it could also just be a way of saying, this is something I really care about. And if you care about it too, then you should support me. Right? Um, so one thing that's coming out of this picture is that actually um, the distinction between the deontic and the instantive and the practices of, say, promising and inviting into a project are, are pretty much orthogonal. Um, yeah. Hi, Adrian. Hi, Steve. This is a little bit to the side of your point, but uh, I think the main purpose of a, of a campaign promise is to get people to vote for you, okay? Now, mo like most Americans, I'm cynical about most campaign promises, but I don't think I want the institution of making campaign promises to go away, because I think it has one possible good, and that is it allows voters to say later, hey, look, you made this promise. Mm -hmm. Let's keep it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good. So, um, right. Even if there's no such thing as a campaign promise, um, it still gets, gets people on the hook in some way, is your suggestion. Using the language gets you on the hook. So. Um, so there's a, you s sort of requires a sort of interesting balancing act between being completely cynical about the political process, right? So completely cynical would be something like people only say what they need to say to get elected. It indicates nothing about what they believe, what their goals are, who they are, right? Um, so that's a completely cynical view. Um, and it seems like if you take that to be sort of the view everyone should take, then that suggests promising language should be understood to be empty. And so no one should feel that it gives them any kind of hook or standing relative to the person using the language. But it does seem like a, a, a legitimate position to occupy, to be cynical and say, people say what they need to say to get elected. Um, but that doesn't mean that the language has become totally empty. It's still, they still are on the hook in some way, yeah. Professor, thank you for your talk. Uh, particularly given your expertise in hope, I, it seems intuitively that hope and instantive relationships seem to be tied. Uh, could you expand a little bit more explicitly <laughs> on, on that relationship mm -hmm. if you agree mm -hmm. with that intuition and sort of shared uh, origins and implications of that? Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. I didn't plant her, by the way. Um, so, right, so in the last chapter of my uh, my published book, um, it's focused on what in that, in that book I call normative hope and what I would now call interpersonal hope. And um, this stuff and the idea of the instantive relationship is building off of that. And, and I really, I do think of um, having an instantive relationship with someone as arising out of investing hope in them, right? So um, I think I was sort of taking the opportunity to experiment with talking about this without talking about hope. Um, but, uh, but I do think that, um, I mean, it, at least in most of the cases I'm imagining, you can see the people as investing hope in each other. You know, the mountain climbing team, they're investing, they're placing their hopes in each other. It's not just that, that they hope to be able to climb the mountain together, it's that you know, I place my hope in you and you place your hope in me that we together can do this, something like that. Um, and, and similar, I think it's very straightforward in the political process, right? It seems like, you know, what we're doing is we're placing our hope in, our can in the candidates that we sort of hitch our wagons to. I mean, and that's why hope, hope language is so prevalent in the, in the political world and in the campaign process. That's not just an invitation to hope for a better future. It's an invitation to invest your hope in me as the candidate. 
um, that, and, and I think that that's another way of characterizing um, what I'm calling the instantive relationship, yeah. That investing hope in a person is coming to have this kind of standing relative to them where you uh, can urge and press expectations on them. Thank you. Thank you for your fascinating talk, which actually leaves me with many, many questions um, that I can't answer. But I have one small one. You repeatedly sort of use a very friendly argument about politicians who break promises, so to speak, which is that precisely given how difficult it is to achieve any of these issues, um, obviously like Guantanamo, like closing Guantanamo, um, you don't, you don't feel anger, it's indeed something else, and then you tease out what that else could mm -hmm. be and whatever. Yeah. For, for the record, I was pissed about Guantanamo. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> frankly, I thought there was a promise. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I do not actually... Right, and the fact that I was angry indicates that I thought it was a promise too. Correct. Yeah. So many of us do think it is, and for example, if I had been a prisoner in Guantanamo, uh, I would have certainly not thought, well, you know, he gave it a fair shot, yeah. but I understand healthcare, <laughs> you know. <laughs> So might it have something to do as well with how, how important the issue is to our own livelihoods or sense of self or, or definition of self? Might that too have something to do with how we end mm -hmm. up reacting? No doubt, yeah. I'm, I'm sure that has something to do. I mean, what I was pushing was that the difference between being anger, angry and being disappointed doesn't turn on how important say the goal is to you, right? So, you know, I was angry about Guantanamo and I was really disappointed too, right? Um, so, I mean, I think I, that reveals on this analysis both a deontic and instantive relationship that I had in virtue of having come, become invested in him. Um, so, right, so in, in, in articulating the no promises view, I may have attributed it to myself too strongly. I just meant to indicate um, a, a conceptual space that we sometimes, and, and some people always, occupy um, that makes sense of why maybe even when something does matter to me a lot, I don't end up angry or disappointed, right? So, I mean, if, uh, you know, I really wanted a single payer system and we ended up with what we got, um, you know, I, the autobiography is kind of pointless here. It's just one position that a lot of people had was they weren't disappointed by it. Many people were disappointed. Many people were angry, those who won single payer systems and didn't get it. But many also just said this was absolutely the closest we could get in this political climate. Um, and so they're not angry. They're not disappointed. They don't feel there was a failing. Um, and it doesn't, it doesn't damage the deontic or the instantive relationship that they have with the politician. It's based actually on our assessment of how complicated it really was. We may be madder at things we perceive to be easy enough that mm -hmm. we could have done it, right. and less mad at mm -hmm. things we kind of realize intellectually should. Mm -hmm. That's really yeah. hard. Yeah. yeah, and I think the Guantanamo case, I mean, I know I personally, I, just being naive, probably hadn't thought about how complicated it would be and how it just seemed like just close the place, right? Um, and then he kind of encouraged that with his own language of the straightforward promise, I will do this and I will do it right, upon, right away. He c encouraged people to see it as kind of a simple just do it matter, um, which it really wasn't at all. Yeah. Can you hear me? It's been really stimulating. I wanted to ask, I think you're, you're absolutely correct that these relationships coexist and that we find, them, we find ourselves in them without a sense of intent or purpose. Do you have any intuition about which of these relationships is more powerful in moving human behavior? Um, because in some cases, we do have a choice as to what to put in the foreground or in the background. Uh, we can organize our collective as tight-knit communities in which arguably the instantive is in the foreground or not. Uh, even in marital relationships, the use of prenuptial agreements, uh, the use of heavy use of contract to specify those rights and obligations over more of a, an emotional, relational, instantive approach so uh, maybe I'm asking a question about the normative view of the choice of the deontic and the instantive mm -hmm. and what your own intuitions are 
if that hasn't been a, yet a focus of your research. Yeah, cool. I like that question a lot. So, yeah, I have a lot of not very well formed thoughts about it, but um, so one thought was that I mean, I think I think it's not just in moral philosophy that the deontic has come to kind of occupy our attention. If you think of the prominence of the human rights movement, right, as sort of this is the global movement to improve people's lives globally, um, it's rights-based, right? It's about obligations and the deontic. Um, and so I think it's come to really have a kind of prominence in our, um, in our vision. Um, and then it's an empirical question of whether, if you're just thinking about what's sort of most effective for bringing about improved relationships among human beings and improved uh, qualities of life globally, um, whether it would be more effective to be sort of focused on the instantive. Um, so I think that there's these really interesting um, sort of pragmatic questions in the vicinity, um, which are also moral questions because they're about achieving morally important outcomes, right? Um, and that the answers to those are largely empirical. Um, I think that there's probably also some really interesting, um, more a priori uh, questions about what's fitting to a relationship and what's the appropriate way to be relating to a person given other facets of your relationship. So, right, so in a romantic relationship, you might think that it, you know, I think a lot of people feel that in a romantic relationship, you're getting it wrong if it's all about demanding your rights from the other. Um, or even if it's largely about that, you, you know, that, that when the, you know, I have a right to you doing this for me, when that, when that comes up, that's when things have gone a little off track, right? Um, and that's not just because it's bad for the relationship, it's because it's somehow inappropriate to the relationship. Um, so I think that would be, that's a really interesting avenue for exploration is thinking about um, how the instantive and the deontic, what they tell us about the way that we value a person and what they tell us about the way that we value the relationship we're in with them. Yeah. So thank you very much, Professor. This is very interesting and stimulating. And thank you, Akshata, for your tremendously generous uh, commitment that makes this wonderful lunch and presentation happen. Uh, I'm curious about the practical application of this research in that it seems to me hope indeed is inspirational. So if you're informing a candidate, roll the clock back 2020 hindsight, you're advising Obama on how he should deal with this Guantanamo issue, knowing the risks attendant to getting it actually done, mm -hmm. um, which he was probably attuned to. But like most candidates, they're not about to eliminate the risk um, because eliminating risk kind of takes away the hope element and you take away the inspiration of the voters. Oh, right. If he, say, if he were to instead say, um, I'll promise you that I'll do my best as long as it doesn't involve sacrificing the other important projects that we care about. Yeah. Right. yeah. In other words, it was be, takes away the be risk, hopelessly but yeah. honest. Yeah. You know, I mean, is, is that any way to yeah. win right. an election? Right. You know, I mean, would you, how would you inform Obama in mm -hmm. retrospect? Mm -hmm. Oh, well... I mean, I think he actually, I don't remember if he actually used the word promise, but he, uh, he definitely made a kind of assertion that had a complete ring of promise to it, right? Um, and I think there's probably an equally inspirational way to talk about that subject that doesn't have that ring to it, but instead has the ring about this is what matters to me and I know it matters to you, right? This is the kind of thing that I care about. Um, and that my opponent doesn't, right? That, that, that there's a way to be inspirational without, I mean, you know, that's, a, that's actually for him a really oddly ham-fisted way of articulating his values and that's, he doesn't usually slip in that way, I don't think. I mean, I, I, because he's so, he's so eloquent, right? Um, he's good, he's, that's precisely why he's such an inspirational speaker is because he is so good at articulating his values in a way that's not misleading and yet that is inspiring, as, as you say. So, and but, bring so then for, for politicians, put another way then, it's, it's just simply um, not worth it to eliminate the risk of disappoint, disappointment and anger um, by virtue. It, it, in other words, it, it's just not worth it to be boringly truthful 
It's not worth it for any of us to try to, in any of our relationships, eliminate the risks of anger and disappointment. Because the only way to eliminate those risks is to actually eliminate the relationships I'm talking about, right? Is to make it the case that nobody has a claim of right against me. Because if someone has a claim of right against me, that means they have standing to be angry at me if I violate that right. If someone has standing to urge me to do something you know, for them, that means that they have standing to be disappointed in me if I let them down. Um, and so to, to get rid of the, to, to eliminate the risk of having these bad feelings is to eliminate the relationships entirely, right? Which I, I can't even imagine what that would mean. I don't, I don't think we'd have human relationships anymore, anything recognizable like that. We are unfortunately out of time. Please join me in thanking Professor Martin for her presentation today.